This is a section of our Wealth and Poverty course uh, about the roots of poverty and the roots of our attitudes about the poor. Uh, and these influences uh, right down to the present day. Uh, and the basic question here is why do we see the poor as different from the rest of us? And there's a lot of evidence that we do. Um, let's take this story back all the way to John Calvin the Protestant reformer of the 16th century. Uh, he was French by birth. He settled in Geneva, Switzerland, and that's where uh, he uh, became well known. Um, his followers today include Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Reformed churches like Dutch Reformed, uh, and in varying ways, they still uh, follow the basic theology of John Calvin. Uh, the American Puritans, uh, to the point here, were Calvinists, and they left uh, an enormous imprint on American culture. Now, the central idea of Calvin was, was predestination, that God started with a covenant, an agreement of works, works meaning good deeds that people do, what how people act in their lives, and then they would uh, be saved or not, depending on what they did. But then Adam and Eve sinned, known as the original sin, uh, and then God was angry, and he withdrew the covenant of works, and he replaced it with a covenant of grace. Now, maybe the most important thing to know about grace is that it's freely given. You can't earn it. You can't merit it. Uh, and according to Calvin, God elects a few for salvation the moment they're conceived, before they're even born. Uh, and there's nothing that anybody can do about that. All others are damned. Now, I'm not speaking in my own voice. I'm simply relaying uh, the theology of predestination here. Calvin tended to view humans very negatively. There were the elect, those who had been predestined for heaven, and there were the damned. Uh, you'll notice that the damned are a much larger group, but there's also something else that you should notice about this Venn diagram, and that is there is no middle ground. You are in one group or the other. Now, if you apply this to society, there are all sorts of consequences. Uh, and if you believe this, what burning question do you have? What are you most interested in, in knowing if you are a devout believer in Calvin's theology? Well, clearly the question is, which group am I in? Um, only God knows for sure. Well, that's not exactly the best news here. But there are signs of election little telltale signs that might give us a clue as to which of these two groups uh, we're going to spend the rest of eternity in. Um, if you pray, if you read the Bible, if you go to church, if you live a simple moral life, these are good signs that, that God has elected you. Uh, these are religious signs of election. Uh, but this will change, it will morph as in ways that we will talk about. But because you're never sure where you stand, if you're living in a real society, like a small New England town, it's very important to keep up appearances, to look good, because you don't want the rest of the townspeople to think that you were headed for the wrong place, uh, that you were predestined to be damned. Now, here's an important transition. Along with these religious signs of election, there are also secular signs of election. Secular simply means uh, not religious. Uh, so uh, the need to keep up appearances led Puritans to look for these other signs. Now, I'm going to use a term here, secularization. That means that what was religious becomes non-religious. And that happens to Calvin's doctrine of predestination. Uh, now, here's an important question. If God has already elected you, in other words, it's all said and done, what qualities are you likely to possess? 
Are you going to be lazy or hardworking? Well, clearly you'll be hardworking. Uh, will you waste your money or will you be thrifty? Uh, will you be drunk or will you be sober? Uh, will you take the initiative uh, to better yourself? All of these are uh, pretty clear. Uh, if you practice these virtues, of course, what will the frequent result be? It will be material prosperity. So this too becomes a secular sign of election. So those who are better off are superior, morally superior to the poor. And these attitudes are very strong, even among people who don't consider themselves Calvinists, among people who may not have even heard of John Calvin. So wealth then becomes a virtue, a sign that you are one of the elect. Now, let me offer two Christian views of wealth. Jesus' view, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. But let's contrast that with the view of the Episcopal Bishop of Massachusetts in the early 20th century. He said, in the long run, it is only to the man of morality that wealth comes. Godliness is in league with riches. So if, if you're wealthy, in other words, you must be moral. Uh, this is a rather extraordinary statement uh, made by the Episcopal Bishop of Massachusetts. Uh, this is utterly uh, a polar opposite to the message of the gospel. Now, who in uh, American society has been known for secularizing Calvinism? Benjamin Franklin. Franklin was a deist. He wasn't a Calvinist at all. And yet the attitudes come from him that uh, amount to a secular version of Calvinism. He's, he said, it is the working man who is the happy man. It is the, it is the idle man who is the miserable man. Energy and persistence conquer all things. Diligence is the mother of good luck. In other words, luck comes to those who deserve it. These are sometimes called the Ben Franklin virtues. Um, time is money. I am for doing good to the poor, but I differ in opinion about the means. I think the best way of doing good to the poor is not making them easy in poverty, but leading or driving them out of it. How many times have we seen that reflected in things like work requirements for uh, Medicaid or food stamps? This, this is deeply rooted in uh, American culture. Here's another one, Horatio Alger. He wasn't a Calvinist, he was a Unitarian. I mean, that is miles away from Calvinism theologically. But look at his message. He wrote more than 100 novels in the late 19th century. They're often described as, as rags to riches, although really rags to respectability is more accurate. Um, his most famous novel, uh, Ragged Dick, uh, here's, here's a quotation from it. He said, uh, one of the characters said, I hope my lad, Mr. Whitney said, you will prosper and rise in the world. You know, in this free country, poverty is no bar to a man's advancement. So if you're poor and you don't advance, then it's likely to be your fault. Uh, and this, again, is consistent with the idea that luck, and his, his novels are full of luck, uh, luck comes to those who deserve it. Uh, this will give you a sense of that Horatio Alger culture, uh, the mythology. Um, you know, it, now when I say use the word myth, realize it doesn't mean necessarily something that's true or something that's false. It simply means a deeply held cultural belief. And that's what we have here. Look at these titles, Strive and Succeed, Adrift in the City, Ben the Luggage Boy, Fame and Fortune, The Eerie Train Boy, Helping Himself, Mark the Match Boy, Paul the Peddler, Phil the Fiddler, uh, Rough and Ready, Struggling Upward. Uh, if you've read one of these, and I've read about 50 or so from when I was a kid, uh, you, you've read them all. You know, they're, they're all the same basic 
formula. Um, the Young Salesman, the Luck and Pluck series. Uh, now, let's look at some other prominent American secularizers of Calvinism. Mitt Romney, he's not a Calvinist, he's a Mormon. Uh, but look at what he said. People from both political parties has lo have long recognized that welfare without work creates negative incentives that lead to permanent poverty. It robs people of self-esteem. Uh, and this was a famous talk he gave to a group of uh, donors, wealthy campaign donors, uh, in the campaign of 2012. And it went, when uh, someone secretly recorded it and made it public, uh, that was a, a pretty devastating blow to the Romney campaign. And of course, as we know, uh, President Obama was reelected in that, uh, that year. He, he said there are 47% of the people who will, who will vote for the president no matter what who are dependent upon government, who believe that they are victims. These are people who pay no income tax. And so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. Now, we have to point out here that even if someone pays no income tax, they pay all sorts of other taxes, payroll taxes uh, for Social Security and Medicare, uh, state sales taxes, excise taxes, all sorts of uh, gasoline taxes. There are all sorts of other taxes that they pay. So uh, this is at, at best misleading. Um, but this is something you get all the time. Um, and he says a corporation is a person. Uh, another you know, a famous quotation of Mitt Romney. Uh, here's another one, Paul Ryan, who became Speaker of the House. He's not a Calvinist, he's a Catholic. Uh, but then look at what he said. Right now, about 60% of the American people get more benefits in dollar value from the federal government than they pay back in taxes, Ryan said. So we're going to a majority of takers versus makers in America, and that will be tough to come back from that. They will be dependent on the government for their livelihoods rather than uh, on themselves. Um, notice he's dividing society into two groups, uh, the takers and the makers. Uh, that's, that's a short step from the elect and the damned. Um, th this is very Calvinist coming from uh, a Catholic. He said, we don't want to turn the safety net into a hammock that lulls able-bodied people into complacency and dependence. Uh, are we interested in treating the symptoms of poverty and economic stagnation through income redistribution and class warfare, or do we want to go at the root causes of poverty and economic stagnation by promoting pro-growth policies that promote prosperity? Uh, the problem with pro-growth, of course, is that uh, it gets very unevenly distributed, and that's what we've seen uh, in the United States in the last uh, half century. Now, remember we looked at this uh, Venn diagram, the elect and the damned, with no middle ground between the two. If you want to look at, at how secularization works, you can just change the labels and keep the diagram. Rich and poor, or maybe workers and unemployed, or middle class and the poor. Uh, Democrats like to talk about the middle class, boosting the middle class, but it's been a long time since uh, the majority of Democratic political candidates uh, have prioritized the poor. Uh, you know, and, and you can contrast that with Catholic social teaching, which talks about a, a prefer preferential option for the poor. Um, so this is not something that's limited to one political party and not the other. Um, okay. And here, Paul Ryan, the makers and the takers. But we have to be careful because there are too many takers out there. And our version. Can you imagine an intense sports rivalry? between the Buddhists and the, and the uh, Confucians, for example, or the Taoists. Uh, 
it doesn't compute. This is essential to our society, the, the idea of dividing people into two groups, whether they're the cowboys and the Indians, or the rich and the poor, or the middle class and the unemployed, or the elect and the damned.